And admittedly here, like, before I transition, this is more so related to the notion that the Southwest was stolen um, mm. from the Mexicans. Like, this stuff is so important because it drives modern-day political narratives. Like, there are people out there who believe that they are entitled to, um, you know, sovereign American territory simply because whitey evil white people did wrong, you know, 300 years ago. This stuff isn't just, you know, dusty old history. I mean, look at mm -hmm. there's a there's a Facebook page with 11,000 reactions, 229 comments, 6.6 thousand shares that says Brown Power. That's the name of the page. Can you imagine, uh -huh. you know, not to, to sound like a boomer, but can you imagine if the situations were reversed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. In my college, in my college, in one of the rooms we have, there's literally a uh, some kind of wall painting of a yellow fist with the words Asian power under it, you know, and then we see, we see black power. We see that in other places too. Totally fine. No, no, and, nothing to be concerned about. And these people like this isn't these people daydream of this to the point where they're posting, you know, weird map edits of the Republic of Aztlan, you know, the Mexican, they literally are agitating for a pseudo Mexican reconquista, which mm -hmm. is, is horrifying to consider. Um, and this isn't this is stuff that's leveled at the United States with respect to the Native Americans as well. Um, if you take a look here, the People's Republic of China um, is accusing the United States of having perpetrated a genocide against the Indians because they said in the Declaration of Independence um, they talked about the merciless Indian savages, which they objectively were. They objectively were, or they're talking about a cultural genocide with with no sense of self awareness, you know, with respect to the cultural genocide that actually is going on right now, and you know, bloody massacres and atrocities, as though that this were a one sided affair. Like this is stuff that has implications into the modern day, and as time goes on, you know, these these accusations get get more and more ridiculous. Like this document right here too granted i'm not going to make an account and then pay for uh you know to get beyond the paywall for the whole document but i've got the majority of it here and in the summary they're leveling this blood libel against white people that um you know white people are responsible for um intertribal violence enslavement disease the white people are responsible for disease even though they didn't even understand on a technical level, how disease worked beyond yes. you should probably remember <laughs> germ, the germ theory, theory did germ not theory. become mainstream till 1800s, till the 1800s. In the United States, for certain, it wasn't uh, mainstream until the 1870s after the Civil War. They blame white people for um, Native Americans becoming disproportionately alcoholic, which was a stereotype I wasn't even certain was true until it's, you know, here it is in black and white before me or the loss of mm -hmm. land and resources as though they weren't constantly fighting f with one another over land and resources or the forced removal. They want to talk about the forced removal of, um, you know, Indians, the trail of tears and reservations, even though in the context of the time, and I'm not even going to comment on the morality of having, having done this and whether or not, um, the trail of tears was excessively brutal, but the purpose and intentions do matter. The purpose of the Indian Removal Act was because Andrew Jackson and other American legislators saw the writing on the wall that if the current trend continued, Native Americans wouldn't exist at all. So they had to be protected. They had to be sequestered away on their own land with functional autonomy. You got to remember that they even had debates with, you know, as late as the passage of the 14th Amendment. And I did mention this in, in my video on the 14th Amendment. They had debates as to whether or not U.S. citizenship would be conferred onto the Indians by virtue of the fact that birthright citizenship was now a thing. Now, you can say, you know, through the modern prism that this was intended to sort of disenfranchise the Indians, but not so. This was a recognition that these were sovereign Indian nations, and it's referred to as such in, in multiple um, U.S. history documents. Um, I see you pinged me. Do you want me to put this on the screen yeah. right now? Yeah, just some memes. The, the one that's uh, 
at the top of the relocation with the tanky. Do you, do you see that one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to show that one because you mentioned relocation. I thought it was appropriate. There are no lands for certain races of people, you Nazi. The earth belongs to everyone equally. Pakistanis are as British as native Englishmen. Also, the colonizers of America stole the land from the rightful Native Americans who are its rightful owners. And yeah, that's, I mean, that gets to the crux of it is, you know, what's good for the goose ought to be good for the gander. And there's this cognitive dissonance among the, and the, that cognitive dissonance is really confusing to boomer cons. And again, not to keep bringing up my own, <laughs> my own videos, but I mentioned this in my video on the problem with conservatives is it's like they're they're out here playing checkers while the left is playing chess. They're not even playing the same damn game. They can't even mm -hmm. see the true intentions. They can't even see the true intentions of their adversary. And so they think that when they point out cognitive dissonance like this, right conflicts, it's going to be a huge own. And that'll, that'll show the libs that'll convert them. Yeah, that'll it's... show them how stupid they are. But really what? what they fail to understand is the whole point is to do bad things to whitey. That's the whole right. point of their movement. Well, I mean, it's a it's a point that the distributist makes fairly regularly. He makes fun of the mainstream corporate right wing news. Always, 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 always. I've shown B. Williams this. Every other article is seemingly calling out the hypocrisy of the left on this and the hypocrisy of the left on that. The left's hypocrisy over AOC saying this one thing. It's like the the left does not care about that, right? The distributist said that you should swap every sentence. Of the left is hypocritical about X with the left does not care about X, right? It just, it doesn't deter them. The, the, the fact that you, oh, I exposed a contradiction. Don't you feel bad about it now? No, they don't. It, it doesn't matter. And on some level, most of like, them are aware of the contradiction. Like you said, they just don't give a shit because they, yeah. like, the whole point of their movement. And this is why you see, you know, what ought to be diametrically opposed forces, right? Like the class, the example I used is transvestites and, and, you know, hardcore conservative Muslims voting for the same political party. <laughs> That's because it's right. not, it's not about actual ideas. Not at this juncture. You can make the claim that, you know, after Whitey's gone, they'll eat each other alive, which I, I happen to think is true. But the whole point is the left at this point in time is, is, just the anti-white party and Correct. conservatives fail to recognize that this is the this is the struggle in which they are engaged and if you can't even understand a the nature of that struggle a, i mean you're screwed mm -hmm. a good quote from i think it's Oren mcintyre or it might be battle beagle uh, battle beagle on twitter is um it's not hypocrisy it's hierarchy and this, what this basically means is that you know uh it, it, the whole point of it isn't like uh, the whole point of left just with this stuff isn't to have a co correct belief it's just to hate white people and it's, exactly. it's just that white people are at the bottom of the hierarchy and white people deserve to be destroyed and all this stuff and i've, I've pulled up your ussr meme as well i know there's a, a lag on the stream and you guys can't see uh -huh. my my screen but i'll go uh, ahead and read I this see it. one I see too it. Relocation is literally fucking genocide, and the U.S. is literally genocidal. Look at the Trail of Tears. The USSR didn't genocide the taters. They were just relocated. <laughs> taters. Yeah. Tatars. Tatars, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't I think know. it's Tatars, but yeah. yeah it's... Oh, okay. Expect a fast. <laughs> taters, taters, is taters is better. Haters is better. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the meme is, is, I think, alluding to a fairly rare yeah. cross-section of people. I mean, usually, and there are a lot of shit libs out there, but not tankies. Like, they don't unironically defend it's, the Soviet it's people Union. Like, um, it's, it's people like Bad Empanada, those, those people yes. who are... Yeah, the, the Holodomor deniers like him. Yeah, I mean the the communist apologists, the people who literally would love to see you know the the rise of the Soviet Union again. Uh, also, one, one interesting thing about the um, uh, meme is that given what the Tatars did to the Russians prior to uh, getting conquered, what the Soviets did to them was really, frankly, way less than what they deserved. Um, just oh, is that right? So they didn't do it for yeah. no reason. Oh, it was there was a lot of reason to do it to the Tatars, and, and the Soviets were anything but like brutal. They were they were very 
lax with the Tatars comparatively to what the Tatars had done when the well, Tatars look, look who's a tanky now. Holy shit. <laughs> well, and just reading the final meme you, you put up uh, for me to show in the stream. Yeah. White people stole this land. Well, that means you should give it back. No, it means we need to invite the rest of the world to live on your land with us. <laughs> And again, this is where this is where boomers get tripped up and think, "Oh, it's so inconsistent." Don't they understand? I just need to tell them about how inconsistent they are. Maybe they'll do some some reflection. It's like, well, no. The reason that there's this mania to invite so many people on our land is because there's certain um, <coughs> white people who want to bring on as many people into this country as possible. It's like that. It, it, do, it doesn't have to be like totally internally consistent. The whole point is that it fucks over people like us. That's like the full effect of all of it. Yeah, truly, I do get grow tired of some of our fellow white people. That's for sure. I know, I know those uh, those crackers, man. Those uh, those super crackers. And again, there's you know there's there's article after article on this like there's literally the holocaust museum in houston talking about the genocide of indigenous peoples as yes. though that there was yeah. some there was some concerted effort by white americans at the time to literally exterminate the native population and if that were the case one would think that they wouldn't put them on reservations and there wouldn't have been a bunch of rhetoric at the time about how we have to preserve the indian nations you would think that they would just have ceased to exist because of the technological disparity, but right. Yeah, it's kind of weird that they still have reservations. Technically, like we haven't just fully eaten them up and uh, and mongolized them, so to speak. Like you remember what the Mongols did? They just they it was a deliberate policy. I remember learning about this in my Korean history college course, where the Mongols would just do their damnedest in their like local a delegative leadership areas like certain areas they had control of that were separate from where they came from and they just make sure to implant themselves they make sure to to take those regional leaders and you know hook them up with these mongolian women so they could try to embed the mongolian bloodline in wherever they were conquering like to just try to wipe out the people as thoroughly as possible well and that's where i suspect that modern day amerindians or native americans or whatever the term de jure is um, for this group of people, for the red man. Um, I suspect that they would be very opposed to the abolition of the reservation system, even though it's perceived as a, a great injustice. And to sort of put into context, you know, the conflicts with the Native Americans, I think it's important to point out, too, that it's not just white Europeans who were having issues with these hostile Native American tribes. It was also the mestizos in the Mexican government. <clears throat> and that was a whole, <clears throat> that was part of the, the point of inviting white settlers into the territory that would later become <clears throat> Texas and the American Southwest was you have to understand that the Mexico, the northern territories of Mexico were largely lawless, same as they are today, and they were plagued. They were plagued by mestizo bandits as well as hostile Native American tribes like the Apache. And just to just to quote this document here, you know, I'll I'll quote it verbatim: a military invasion to force non-Christian Indians to conform was out of the question because it could not be financed. The Mexican government's finances were in such disrepair that immediately after independence, the missions were ordered to support the military at no cost. With the exception of Santa Fe and San Elizario, most presidios were left with few soldiers who were converted to centers of under civilian military control. So the Mexican government, the Mexican army, by virtue of the fact that they just had civil war after civil war with Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, I think being deposed, he was deposed something like seven times. Um, they, they could not oh deal goodness. with the hot, the, the overt hostility of Indian tribes. Like it, they just couldn't do it. So what's the solution? Well, number one, Mexican citizens were required to take full responsibility for their military defense. Um, and expected to form civilian militia units. So yeah, screw you. you, we were not coming to save you. So that was a large part of the reason why those territories weren't settled. And the other per, or, um, the other portion of it is they knew that 
white people had a lot of experience dealing with hostile Native American tribes, and that's part of the, the reason white people were invited to settle there. Their hope was that they would civilize the territory at no cost to the Mexican government. Um, and of course, when you get two, uh, two diametric, diametrically opposed groups of people, um, Protestants and Catholics, mestizos and whites, conflict is bound to occur. Uh, and that would later transition into, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sifting through documents here as well, transition into the, Mex or the Texas Re Revolution and the Mexican-American War. Um, yeah, here's another document saying that um, Anglo-Americans continued to settle in Texas with the tacit approval of the frontier officials who desperately wanted to augment the province's population of useful citizens, i.e. not bandits and Native Americans. Um, and this diversion between divergence between national policy and regional practice would continue under independent Mexico. So this is this is going on, you know, fairly early in in Mexican history as well. So it's not just whitey that's having trouble with hostile Native American tribes. And at a certain point, you have to question, is it you or is it everyone else that's the problem? Well, I don't even know if it even needs to be that severe. Like, I just think it's the natural fact that when divergent groups clash together, conflict is inevitable. And, and it and wasn't... Our, our, our guiding assumption shouldn't be, well, obviously it's the white man's fault that this harmony, disharmony keeps happening, that this, uh, these problems keep arising. And it's like, it's not even just one tribe. It's not, it'd be one thing if it were, okay, they had a real problem with, uh, you know, the Navajo. They were just a real problem, but everybody else was peaceful. No, it's like they're having wars with the Spanish. They're having wars with Mexico. They're having wars with the United States. It's not even just one group. Like, people fail to recognize that the Apache, they weren't one tribe. The Apache was similar to the Iroquois Confederacy insofar as it was a bunch of different tribes that had banded together with the goal in mind of, you know, sort of fuck whitey um, to be really reductive with it. It's the Navajo. You know, it's the um, the Yavapai um, and all these different, I'm not going to read them all off here, but all these different smaller tribes, like this isn't, it's, it's the nature of humanity, really. So to say that this is something unique to, you know, white people being present on the continent and that's why all this is happening is just, I mean, it's, it's blood libel, not to keep repeating that term, but it's, it's blood libel. Oh, we should keep repeating it. <laughs> right. You got to embed it into everybody's consciousness. Make it clear that is what is happening to us. Well, and also, um, I'm sitting, this is one that I didn't put on our collective Google Doc. Um, so well, I have the, colonization, yeah. the colonization uh, of America was. Uh, I mean, you can tell it's not that the Native Americans weren't like any normal country because it didn't happen in the same way as conquering a normal sort of state. Right. Because it used to be, you know, when you conquered a state, you had they had permanent cities, they had professional armies, uh, they had, you know, their own uh, dedicated generals, you know, all this, all this complex stuff. Um, but when it came, and like you couldn't just you couldn't just uh, like build your own city in their territory, um, but when it comes to like the colonization of North America, you know, white people again and again and again and again were able to build permanent cities. This is not possible when you conquer like an actual state. So, so you know, it's the idea that the Native Americans were some monolith uh, with that just as advanced as. Uh, uh, as any normal state, and then it was like, and it was a uh, conquest like any other is ridiculous. 
Well, and I want to make sure we get to the Richard Hofstetter quotes. So yes, I, have, I love this quote. I have pulled up this article since it's sort of your your baby here. I'll let you read it. Just let me know when. Um, okay. Yeah, how much no of it you'd like to cover and uh, when you're ready? Because I've yeah, I've scrolled down at this point to the part you highlighted in the the Google Doc, but yeah, I can I can see it perfectly fine. So let's go. Okay. Finally, and no less imperatively. There were the Indians, who were all too often regarded by American frontiersmen as another breed of wild animal. The situation of the Indians, constantly under new pressures from white encroachments, naturally commands modern sympathy, but they were, in fact, partly from the very desperation of their case, often formidable, especially in the early days when they... Uh, oh, the, the, the scroll lag got me, sorry. Um, when they were an important force in the international rivalries of England, France, and Spain, and North America. Like the white man, they had guns, and like him, they committed massacres. Modern critics of our culture, who, like Susan Sontag, seem to know nothing of American history, who regard the white race as a cancer and assert that the U.S. was founded on a genocide, may fantasize that the Indians fought according to the rules of the Geneva Convention, but in the tragic conflict of which they were to be the chief victims, they were capable of striking terrible blows. In King Philip's War, 1675 to 1676, they damaged half the towns of New England, destroyed a dozen, and killed an estimated one out of every 16 males of military age among the settlers. Later, the Deerfield and other frontier massacres left powerful scars on the frontier memory. And in the formative days of the colonial period, Wariness of sudden Indian raids and semi-military preparations to combat them were common on the western borders of settlement. Men and women, young and old, were all safer if they could command a rifle. And I think that's uh, that's about it. Well, and that's important to note is that, you know, at a, at a certain point in time, like, the Indians did get horses, which they got from Europeans. They had a fair number of firearms among them. They were, in many instances, similarly equipped. Um but yeah, like people take big issue with that phrase in the Declaration of uh, Independence where they're talking about the crimes of the King of Great Britain, King George III, where, they, where he talks about um, how he's endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. At a certain point, the word merciless and the word savage has to be applicable in, in real life. There has to be something in real life that's merciless and savage. And... When you're talking about people who would um, not discriminate, again, to, to quote from the Declaration of Independence, they didn't discriminate based on age conditions or sexes. Um, they didn't adhere to the rules of the Geneva Convention, which, of course, didn't exist. But, you know, the the rules of war, the common, you know, the which is. Yeah, we know, we know what's meant by that, by, right. uh, by good natured war rules. You know, they're, they're destroying half the towns of New England, which if you think that King Philip's War still didn't, uh, you know, leave an impression in the minds of the people alive at the time of the American founding, you're wrong. You know, and the, and the subsequent American Indian Wars as well. You know, these, the, the trope of the noble savage is, um, you know, really sickening. I, I get it tired of it. I mean, it, it needs to die. Oh, absolutely. Um, I saw that you, um, we can talk about, uh, against land acknowledgements if you want me to pull that up next. Yeah. The way I archived the link, I think there's a certain quote that should be highlighted already. So it'll take you to where you need to go. But if it doesn't, I'll tell you where to control F. It did not. Ah, damn it. Okay. But put control F. I am, uh, there we go. I don't know how far you want me to scroll down, but I'll, I'll let you handle this as well. Yeah, it's not showing up on the screen yet, but I, I think, are you on the I am a Georgist? And according yeah, to, yep. yeah, okay. So, uh, Stuart Regis, this University of Washington professor, I am a Georgist, and according to the Georgist worldview, Native Americans have no special claim to any land, just like the rest of us. But since few are familiar with that economic ideology, I leaned instead on a principle described in John Locke's second treatise on government now known as the labor theory of property, or the homestead principle. To the Georgist idea that land is owned in common by all living people, Locke added that by mixing one's labor with the land, one encloses it from the shared property, because people own the products of their labor. If, for example, you make the effort to grow corn on an acre of land, 
you come to own the acre of land, so long as there's still plenty of land left for others to use. And then uh, we can... There's a lot left there, but that's kind of the main paragraph, that you have to use the land in order to own it. And I remember there was a very funny analogy you mentioned to me, Jim Dewey. That, yeah, um, so I had a professor who was talking about this very same topic and this very same concept, um, and he said to me, and mind you, this was a small class. There were probably, this was a master's level course. Um, there were probably six or seven of us in that classroom. And he said, suppose, and this is a this is a big room, 70 desks in there probably. He says, suppose you were here first, Jim Dewey, and you laid claim to all these desks around. Though you can only sit in one, you have the capability to only sit in one desk. Your claim, because you can only sit in one desk, your claim to the other 69 desks in the classroom is bunk. It's not a valid claim. You have 69. to be able to utilize the land. You don't just get to lay claim to whatever you want because you were in the general vicinity first. And that improvement on the land, that improvement on the land or that ass in that seat, you know, that ass in that chair, um, certainly takes pre precedence over some sort of vague notion of we were here first therefore you can't occupy territory that we aren't currently occupying if that makes any sense yeah yeah or as uh, the famous I mean, Ryan Falk quote, do more uh, the, the oh, Ryan Falk quote of if you piss in the ocean it doesn't make it yours yeah exactly no, that, that doesn't, it doesn't make the entire ocean yours oh yeah well yeah, but even even dogs do more work to mark their territory <laughs> Right, yes. But that's just, that, it's not like they piss near a fire hydrant or whatever, and then like the entire city block becomes theirs. Well, right. yeah, but you know what I mean. No, not exactly. I was just, I was expanding on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so a little bit of background, you know, and this is this is the point where I'd like to segue into sort of the Mexican-American War. And yeah, I know it's a Wikipedia page, but generally they're fairly well cited and it cuts through most of the BS. You know, there's there's this notion out there that the United States has stolen land from Mexico through an unjust war, but they fail to understand the context of the Mexican-American War. So like we, we talked about earlier, the whole context of white people being invited to uh, the Mexican territory was in large part due to the fact that the Mexican government, um, whichever one happened to be in power at the time because politics were a little dicey in Mexico in that day and age, um, they were unable to control that territory and they wanted civilized people to come in there. So... Um, the only kicker was they had to convert to Catholicism and learn Spanish and a couple of other things. So, um, naturally, as, again, two separate and distinct peoples are wont to do, they come into conflict and the Texans get it in their mind that they're, they want to be independent. Um, they want to be independent. I don't think it's we need to go into any more detail than that. Um, and they fight and win a war against the Mexican government. And Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, um, a general at the time who had later become the ruler of Mexico, the president or emperor or whatever the term de jure was, because there were so many different terms for the leader of their government. <laughs> um, he signed a treaty that said that the boundary between the Republic of Texas and Mexico was the Rio Grande River. And it was understood what the Rio Grande was, where it was, and by both parties that this was the hard boundary between Mexico and Texas. So 10 years later, and this happens in 1836, but 10, 10 years later in 1846, when the United States annexes Texas, um, the Mexicans get real upset because they still felt that they had claim on um, Republic of Texas territory. They They had designs on... At, uh, at a later date and time, sort of annexing Texas again. Now, because the Mexicans are incensed, they march in army across the Rio Grande River up to a river called the Nueces River, which they claim is the new boundary between the United States and uh, Mexico. Now, they claim that the Nueces River is the border because that treaty that they signed with the Republic of Texas, well, it's not a valid treaty. 
It's not a valid treaty because that treaty was signed under duress. So it's the Nueces River. And the notion that a treaty signed under duress is not a valid treaty is just ridiculous to me. Like, you want to talk about the Treaty of Versailles then? Is that no longer a valid treaty? <laughs> Most treaties in the history of man are signed or the, under the implicit threat of force. Like, treaties are either ending hostilities or trying to prevent hostilities um, in, in, a, in a general sense. So the Mexicans undertake an undisputedly hostile act. They march in army up to the border. Even if you claim that that is the border of the United States, they're still marching an army up to the border of the United States, really on sovereign American soil. So naturally, an American army under General Zach Taylor is dispatched to the Nueces River. The Americans staying on the other side of the river, the other side of the disputed territory. And shortly thereafter, the Mexicans lay an ambush and they kill American men and war is declared because American blood was shed on American soil. So the United States Army wa wages two great campaigns. Uh, General Winfield Scott against all odds and really uh, what the greatest military minds of the time supposed would happen uh, wins. At his, his campaign from the landing at, at Veracruz to Mexico City is successful. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, um, you know, Sir Arthur Wellesley at the time famously said, having learned that Scott had landed his troops at Veracruz, said, Scott is lost. So the fact that a victory was pulled off here is pretty impressive. And another army has marched south from, you know, Texas into, you know, and obviously a couple of other things happened. The Battle of Chapultepec Castle... And they march into Mexico City, and they've they've by all counts thoroughly spanked the Mexican the, the Mexican army. There's there's no longer any threat um, of you know the Mexican the, the Mexican army is no longer a threat. Um, the government has capitulated. The United States can do whatever it pleases with Mexican territory. And you know what they decided to do? They decided to purchase a small chunk of the land and give the rest of it back to Mexico. So that's a long-winded way of saying, no, they bought the land when they could have taken it all. It was not stolen. It does not belong to the Mexicans. Like, treaties matter. Right of conquest is a thing. And you were paid for it. So shut up, stop kvetching. You're not entitled to the province of Aztlan. Wait, so are you saying that when the Mongols went on their terror, they didn't buy all of the land they acquired? No, funnily enough, that's um, kind of a unique phenomenon. Um, generally oh. speaking, when people have the ability to get Gibbs for free or get land for free, they usually take it. They, um, they don't out of a sense of... Um, morality or nobility pay people for the land that they could have taken for free and usually they annex all of it usually they annex all of it but you know white people i thought when uh, saddam hussein invaded and annexed kuwait he made sure to pay all of the kuwaiti leaders for taking the land off their hands i thought he did that i guess he didn't i guess it's not a normal thing so i mean and uh, there is some question about you know the morality of the Mexican-American War, even at the time, like Abraham Lincoln was very famously opposed to it. But you have to remember, too, that politics hasn't changed. Like, people were opposed to things just because people, other people were for them, and it was... Oh, yeah. A perfect parallel of that is the Libya War in 2011, when suddenly a lot of people in the Republican Party were very opposed to what Obama and Hillary Clinton were trying to do in Libya, the kinetic military action. Or like even the even invasion though. of Iraq in 2003. I, I think there's a very strong parallel there. Like there's an a really unprovoked attack, you know, maybe with some ostensible justification, but it, an unprovoked attack on American soil that kills Americans. And initially most people are for it, but then because it becomes politically expedient, some people are against it. And so you can't, like, I hate to break it to you guys, but Abraham Lincoln, he wasn't a saint. The voice of Abe wasn't the voice of God. Um, you know, he was a fallible. Oh, you're human, telling so me just that? Just because he was it's against crazy. the war doesn't mean that the war was unjust. So, and I, I covered this at, at, 
a little more in detail in my video on Johnny Harris because that was particularly egregious too. But no, <laughs> you don't have the – like white people didn't do – white people treated – the conquer you know the peoples they conquered far better than anyone else in history did by comparison and that's just a fact that i don't even know how you can reasonably dispute or at least with one foot in the realm of logic dispute <laughs> that's a new phrase i haven't heard that one before that's because i think i just kind of cobbled it together on the spot wow what a prodigy you're a verbal prodigy yeah call me so um Though, too, there's a meme that I'm trying to put in our server that is tangentially related that kind of underscores the whole... It, it, just, just the whole issue with with uh, white people like us. Like, it's um, our propensity to get taken advantage of. I think I just put it in there now. Um, uh, I think it's analogous. I know I've been very vague about it, but I just want people...